To talk more about how the media has shaped these elections, we're joined by Azi Pebera, senior reporter with The Politico. Azi has covered politics with some of the leading papers in New York City. And in 2013, he was named as the best uh, state-based political reporters in New York by The Washington Post. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Azi, you seem to have done it all when it comes to <laughs> politics in the city. Yes, uh, I started reporting in a local newspaper in Queens, and then I started writing about citywide politics in 2005 when Mayor Michael Bloomberg was running for re-election. And then we very quickly saw things like the Anthony Weiner scandal, the Elliot Spitzer scandal. We saw a candidate run for governor that reminded many people of Donald Trump. So sort of the history is sort of repeating itself if you've been covering it, uh, New York politics. We're talking about this election. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a more <laughs> divisive election? No. Uh, for the last couple of cycles in American politics, we got used to the idea that uh, things were very partisan and very divided, but you didn't have a sense that democracy itself was in danger. And some people have that fear heading into tomorrow's election. Some people say Hillary Clinton is ineligible to run because of this FBI investigation. Some people say Donald Trump's rhetoric endangers voters. And some supporters are saying we should impeach Hillary Clinton on her first day in office. Four years ago, the debate was about um, Mitt Romney's business decisions, good or bad. Four years earlier, it was who's best in charge to work on the economy uh, freshman Senator Barack Obama or veteran Senator John McCain. They weren't talking about, will the democracy survive? You know, when coming to like, will the democracy survive, Trump has threatened to, you know, sue the New York Times and also sue almost anyone who speaks negatively about them. Does, it, does that threaten the very principle of a free press? I think we're going to get sued just for asking that question. <laughs> um, there's something about Donald Trump that we haven't seen in a very long time, and it's this performance as campaigning. And when he says, I'm going to sue you, that's just a statement. There's no legal action behind it until you file paperwork. He hasn't sued the New York Times, and he hasn't really sued anyone this campaign cycle. And when he makes these remarks, his supporters like it. Uh, journalists have a little bit more to write about. but. He feeds into this distrust of media. He feeds into the distrust that people have of the conduits of information. And that has a very damaging effect, even if there's no court action that follows his words. And why this media distrust? And you know, we're seeing the media distrust globally everywhere. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, it's even more profound. How is that? I think there's a, a, a couple of reasons for it. Uh, the first is there's more access to information. I'm old enough to remember that people used to say, if only voters had more information, things would be better. If they only knew what was happening in Washington or in Delhi or, or in other world capitals. And it turns out we overlooked something. We thought the information people were getting would be accurate information. Now, anyone that has connection to the internet can put up a website, and come up with anything that they want to say without being fact-checked and without being uh, qualified. And that means two people in one city that have an unusual idea can now talk to five people in another city that have an idea. And now these different disorganized people with unpopular ideas can now find each other and communicate. So there's more access to unqualified or unverified information. and it makes it more complicated to discuss issues of the economy, of immigration, when you have these all these different voices. I notice there's been a lot of noise, so you're losing that like a discussion of ideas and principles, and you're getting yeah. really down to politics and this alt-right yes. vision. Uh, is that down to social media? Is that the reason why you know it, is the traditional mediums like newspapers right. almost losing their voice? It, it's harder for newspapers to have the same impact they used to have. In New York, at one point, they had 13 daily papers, some printed in the morning, some printed in the evening. But they are now competing with radio stations that have websites. They're competing with 
websites that now do podcasts. They're competing with television stations that now write stories. There's a lot more people competing for voices. Some campaigns even bring out their own news and information. And the other thing that, that I think is sort of underlying these the, the stresses of the media is just the reality of politics right now. You know, America is a divided country on issues like abortion. It wasn't that long ago when gay people didn't didn't have the right to marry. Even uh, interracial marriages were illegal within our lifetime. So there are real issues that divide people, and that is being amplified in a much more complex environment. So if you look at this paper, we were just you know, taking a look at it. Uh, it describes Hillary as Clinton while him as Donald, just to be a bit more <laughs> insulting. Do you think that that bias really exists? Is it built in? Um, for the Daily News, I think there's been a course correction to some degree. Years earlier, when Donald Trump was simply a boisterous real estate developer, he was on the front page regularly. Mm. I think sometimes with headlines, Clinton versus Donald, it could be a matter of space and headlines. Um, but if you look a little bit deeper, usually, especially in the Daily News, Donald is not getting as good coverage, no matter what they call him. And you've also seen the opposite. You see people call her Hillary instead of Clinton as well. Yes. So the use of the, the surname, uh, first name versus surname, is it to diminish the candidate? There has been, a, as much as we have never seen a candidate like Donald Trump, let's remember he is a rich white male. We have seen that in American politics quite often. What we haven't really experienced is a female candidate running on a, as the nominee of a major party. That itself is also news. So how headline writers are describing her, it is sometimes a bumpy lesson in what to do and what not to do. It's quite interesting, you know. Um, we've seen this election from uh, many different sides. And uh, the sense we get in the rest of the world, here is this Trump the buffoon, really, <laughs> right. right, at some level. Uh, orange, that's yeah. it. Yes. You know, the wider media outside the U.S. sees him as, exactly as Rohit says, buffoon. And Hillary, though, understands policy, understands, you know, the America, but still corrupt, in bed with big business. And the Americans unable to trust both of them. So if you actually look at the polls, many of the people are disappointed with both candidates. Right. In, in, in one sense, I can imagine that as much as these candidates are unique, they somehow embody something very American. Establishment politics and Hillary Clinton, she's been in public life for more than 30 years. And then on the other side, you have the ultimate capitalist, a person whose family changed their name in order to personify the striving up by your bootstraps idea. I mean, I was born and raised in, in New York. I sort of lived in this kind of environment, but I can imagine from the outside, when you think of Americanism, the ideas, the images of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are probably not far from people's minds. Lost to think about. Thank you so much, Azzy.